final installment of this year's Tyson Summer Seminar Series. It has certainly been an eventful summer, and we deeply appreciate the participation we've had from the distinguished speakers, as well as our terrific audiences. I'd also like to thank Beth Biro for the awesome work she's done making sure all of these seminars have gone smoothly, even when the internet of some of our speakers cuts out. And so today I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Martha Munoz. Uh, Dr. Munoz received her bachelor's degree from Boston University before moving on to Harvard University where she worked with Donathan, Dr. Jonathan Lassus um, uh, for her PhD. Of course, Dr. Jonathan Lassus just recently returned to Washington University, which is why the name uh, is likely familiar. After finishing, after finishing her PhD, she held postdoctoral positions in the labs of Dr. Craig Moritz at Australian National University, as well as she, Dr. Sheila Patek at um, Duke University. Uh, Dr. Munoz is now an assistant professor at Yale University. And to accompany this really sterling academic trajectory, Dr. Munoz has received many awards and recognitions within the field, including a Young Investigator Award from the American Society of Naturalists, and she was also recently named a scientist to watch by The Scientist magazine. I think it's fair to say that Dr. Munoz is a rising star in the field of evolutionary biology, and if anything, that's perhaps somewhat of an understatement. I can say personally that Dr. Munoz's work has had a large influence on the way that I think about evolution, and I often recommend her papers to the grad students with whom I'm working. I think myself and a lot of other people in the field are, are quite excited to see the directions her lab goes in the coming years. So one last thing before we get going, uh, at the end of Dr. Munoz's talk, you can leave any questions that you have in the chat uh, section and I will relay them uh, during the question and answer period. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Munoz. Thank you so much. Am I, is it, is it working? Great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this incredibly warm introduction, Mike, and thank you so much to the Living Earth Collaborative and the Tyson Research Center and everyone at WashU for inviting me. I surely wish I could be there in person, but I hope we're able to have a wonderful discussion nonetheless. So today I have the opportunity to share some of my research with you, and my research is fundamentally influenced by an observation in nature, which is that evolution proceeds unevenly. By this I mean that some aspects of the phenotype evolve much more quickly than others. So to give an example, when compared to other aspects of their morphology, lizard genitals evolve so rapidly they might be deemed to be evolving at super speed. This is an actual headline from a press release. Just as exciting, there are certain aspects of the fish mandible that can evolve up to 30 times faster than others. Now, keep in mind that this is an integrated structure that needs to work together in order to feed. And yet some features can essentially be in overdrive, evolutionary overdrive, whereas others not so much. But what, what's really going on here? What I'm suggesting or what this is implying is that there are some factors, intrinsic or extrinsic to organisms that can facilitate evolution, allow it to proceed very, very rapidly. Whereas there are others that um, slow evolution down or maybe stop it dead in its tracks. But why is this? Why are some features allowed to drive on evolution's Autobahn, whereas others are stuck in New York City traffic at rush hour. What, what determines this? So I have focused on this question by studying one of evolution's key architects, behavior. Through behavior, organisms are both the agents and the targets of evolution. They, uh, they can uh, expose themselves to more natural selection, in turn hastening evolution, or they can stop evolution dead in its tracks and bring it to a grinding halt. Um, and I usually study behavior um, by studying how organisms interact with one key environmental variable, temperature. So in ectotherms such as lizards, but also most animals, the ability to perform a task such as sprinting is contingent on body temperature such that it's optimized over a relatively narrow range of temperatures and then decreases at higher and lower temperatures until the animal is immobilized. This, um, we describe this relationship using the thermal performance curve and it's really important. This dictates where organisms can occur, how they interact with their environments. This one little squiggle is really fundamental to life. 
And my perspective is to focus how organisms interact with their behavior, with uh, behaviorally interact with their thermal environments, and how that in turn shapes the evolution of the thermal performance curve. My approach is generally to dissect this curve into its component features. So for example, this curve has limits known as the critical thermal lim uh, minimum and critical thermal maximum temperatures above and below which organisms can no longer move. This curve has a maximum. This curve has a temperature at which performance is optimized. There's a range over which performance is maximal or nearly so. So I dissect this curve into its component features and discover the mechanisms shaping its evolution. And I do this first and foremost on reptiles and in particular on anolis lizards. Um, here at WashU, it seems a little redundant to describe anoles, but I'm going to do so anyway because they're wonderful. So this is an extraordinarily diverse lineage of lizards distributed throughout the tropical and subtropical regions of the Western Hemisphere. They are especially diverse in the Caribbean where more than 150 species are found. And as you probably know from Jonathan's extensive studies, they are a wonderful and charismatic lineage of organisms to work with. They're bright and colorful. They have these extensible throat fans, termed dewlaps, that they use in social communication and territory defense. Um, but today I'll be focusing on my favorite kind of anoles, the LBLs, the little brown lizards. And in particular, I'm going to center on one lineage of Hispaniolan anoles known as the Cybotoids. This is a lineage comprised of Anolis cybotes shown here and its close relatives. And what this lineage lacks in oranges and blues and greens, I promise you it makes up for in physiological badassery. So, um, here's a brief outline of where I hope to go today. I'm going to talk about the dual role of behavior first as a break in evolution, how it can slow it down. And then I'm also going to pivot and show how behavior can accelerate evolution, maybe even do so uh, at the same time. And then I'm going to take a step back and ask, why does behavior even matter? Why do we care about it by centering in on the role of behavior in protecting organisms from ongoing climate change. And at the end, hopefully come to some broader conclusions about the role of behavior in evolution and give a little bit of a hint about the direction in which my lab will be going over the next couple of years. So the stories I'd like to share today um, center on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola. So Hispaniola to me is fascinating. This island is dissected by two main mountain chains, the Cordillera Central in the east and the Sierra de Bauruco in the west. And the mountains on this island are incredibly high. The highest peak in the Caribbean, in fact, resides in Hispaniola at over 3,000 meters. Now, when you visit the island, the lush, low elevation habitats are ex exactly what you'd expect from the tropics. There's beautiful and lush music, broadleaf forests, lots of canopied vegetation. The anoles that get to live here lead a very cushy, nice tropical life. But as you start to go up in elevation, and I mean up in elevation, the habitat starts changing dramatically. Starting near 2,000 meters, I'm sorry, yeah, 2,000 meters above sea level, there's a pretty dramatic shift in the habitat. When compared to the lush tropical forests of lower elevation, um, it starts to look more like a moonscape up here. Um, the habitat is much more open. It's the habitat is comprised of these mono-dominant pine forests surrounded by savannas and rocky outcrops. And importantly, it gets cold up there. And I mean really cold. Some of the habitats at high elevation are 20 degrees Celsius more cold than their low elevation counterparts. Um, it's not uncommon, even in summer, to see frost in these habitats. I mean, this is Hispaniola. Um, so when I did my first expedition there, actually, I didn't realize, honestly, how cold it can be up there. I was woefully underprepared to the point that I ended up using my suitcase and some extra clothing just to bundle up. But I wasn't alone at these um, Hispaniolan summits. I had really good company in the form of these Anolis lizards. In the eastern mountains, in the Cordillera Central, you get Anolis shrivi, and in the western mountains, you get Anolis armori. And these are cybatoid anoles. They belong to that lineage that I just mentioned earlier. But they're not the only ones distributed at high elevation in Hispaniola. In fact, the cybatoids as a lineage occupy every possible habitat you can imagine from sea level all the way up to 3,000 meters. Um, they're not distributed equally across these elevations. You have a few species like Anolis whitemani and Anolis longitubialis, which are restricted to sea level environments. 
Two species, Anola uh, stromae and Marcanoi, creep into mid elevation, get up to about 1,000 meters, getting pretty intense. There's one species, Anola cybodes, which is really, really widespread. It's essentially found island wide until about 16, 17, 1800 meters, at which point, um, when the broadleaf forest transitions into this pine forest, it begins to be replaced by these two montane endemics, Anolis armori in the Western mountains and Anolis shrivi in the Eastern mountains. So I was fascinated by this. I was fascinated by the presence of these tropical anoles in habitats that quite honestly reminded me more of Massachusetts, which is where I was studying. So my first question was purely curiosity driven. How do these lizards, these tropical lizards, uh, physiologically compensate, if at all, for these uh, differences in elevation at which they're found. And to explore this, I focused on two key physiological traits, the critical thermal minimum and the critical thermal maximum. So CT min and CT max. CT min describes the lower limit for locomotion and CT max describes the upper limit for locomotion. And essentially to measure these, we perform writing trials in which we systematically cool or heat lizards and measure the temperature at which they lose their ability to write themselves. And we do this using extraordinarily sophisticated equipment such as the uh, heat lamp and bucket shown in this image. So what I did along with my incredible team of undergraduates is scour the island for as many populations of these lizards as possible and measure these thermal limits to explore whether um, CT min and CT max varied across elevation and if so, how? So I'm going to show you the results first for the critical thermal minimum, CT min. On the x-axis of this plot, you have elevation with uh, sea level on the left and uh, high elevation on the right. And on the y-axis, you have uh, cold tolerance or CT min. Each point on this plot is a, pop is a population mean with the standard deviation and the color denotes the specific species in this lineage from which the data come. A lower CT min indicates a population that's more cold tolerant. It was able to withstand colder temperatures before losing the writing response. And what we find, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that montane lizards are much more cold tolerant than their low elevation counterparts. In fact, some of these lizards at high elevation didn't lose their writing response until about three, uh, four and a half, five degrees Celsius in some cases. They could be up to seven degrees Celsius more cold tolerant than their low elevation counterparts. Um, and this makes intuitive sense. What about heat tolerance? So this is the same plot as before. Elevation is on the x-axis. Now heat tolerance is on the y-axis. A higher CT max indicates a more heat tolerant population. Here's what we found. Absolutely no relationship between heat tolerance and elevation and less within population variance, about half as much actually, in heat tolerance than cold tolerance. So what gives? I found this result to be a little bit puzzling. So I decided to go back and, and maybe probe the thermal environment in a bit more detail to really explore the temperatures that organisms were actually experiencing in their habitats. So what I did was visit four sites um, across uh, the Cordillera Central, one at 45 meters, um, another at 700, 1600, and 2450 meters. And I simply measured that I set out a bunch of thermal devices and recorded temperature over the course of a single night um, from each of these localities. And these, uh, these are the results. And this is what I found. So there are a lot of things going on here. First and foremost, there is very little nighttime temperature variation. Temperatures are incredibly homogenous at night. Temperatures are pretty stable as well. And as you can see, there's very little thermal overlap, if any at all, among localities. So this makes sense with respect to our result. You can consider, because of the little thermal overlap among sites, you can conceptually visualize this mountain to be um, structured into distinct thermal zones with elevation, with lizards adjusting their cold tolerance accordingly. So this is an intuitive result. Let's talk now about daytime temperatures when um, temperatures become warmer. So the same exact four localities, except now we're going from sun up to sun down. And here are the results. A lot more thermal variation. In fact, at any given site, we saw up to 
um, you know, 30 to 40 degrees Celsius variation, whereas at night that variation was compressed down to about five to 10 degrees Celsius. So not only is there more thermal variation, but much, if not most of that variation is actually shared among these different sites. So maybe it doesn't get quite as cool at low elevation as it does at high elevation or vice versa, but overall there's a lot of thermal overlap across these sites. So based on that, we can envision, uh, you know, this mountain during the day to be a lot more thermally variable with a lot more shared variability across elevation. Yet the pattern does not precisely mirror that of what we saw in CT Min. We would expect based on this to, to see a lot more within population variation and a clinal uh, relationship between CT max and elevation, but we don't observe that. In fact, the results look more like this. So what's going on? How do we explain this? So there was a piece of this that was that was missing that I hadn't considered. So Mike, I'm gonna put you on the spot. And can you tell me something interesting that's going on in this image of Enola cybotes? Uh, its feet are off the, uh, the leaf. That's right. Its hind foot is elevated off the surface of the really hot leaf. And can you see its, uh, its toes on its forelimbs, how it's curling those back as well? Yep. Right, it's behaviorally reducing contact with the surface of this leaf. It's using behavioral thermal regulation to modify its thermal environment and the temperatures that it experiences. So to take a step back, the concept or the, even the idea of thermal regulation may seem intuitive and obvious to you and me, but as a concept, it's only been formalized by, for less than a century. And it was formalized in the 1940s by two gentlemen, Bob Cowles and Charles Bogert, who spent a long time um, running around the American Southwest, chasing lizards and discovering that desert lizards had surprisingly cool body temperatures relative to the hot deserts that they inhabited. So to explain the idea of thermal regulation, let's take a bird's eye view of a thermal habitat. And maybe it's these um, deep in the forest, it might be too cool for lizards. Maybe it's too shaded and too cool. Maybe out in the open, it's too hot for lizards. Maybe it's just these flanking edge trees that are thermally optimal for these lizards. Let's go ahead and color those thermally optimal patches, a wash you red. And let's imagine that a lizard preferentially shuttled, um, basically wandered around the entire thermal habitat it would experience, uh, if it were a thermal conformer, the highs, the lows, and the in-betweens, and it would experience that full range of thermal variation available to it. But if in contrast, a lizard were to thermal regulate, it would actually only preferentially shuttle between those thermally optimal patches and only experience a narrow subset of the thermal environment. And so from that lizard's perspective, the thermal environment might look more like this. And in fact, that's exactly what these lizards are doing. When we go back to those same populations from which we gathered CT min and CT max data and look at field measured body temperature, we find that it barely shifts despite these temperatures being measured over, you know, about two and a half kilometers of elevational difference. It, from sea level to 2,500 meters, it drops about a degree and a half. To, to put this in context, if those lizards were behaviorally passive with respect to the thermal environment, temperature should drop by more by close to about 10 degrees Celsius. So clearly these lizards are compensating for their thermal environments. And in fact, what essentially is going on is that um, they're, they're homogenizing the environment. What would look to the lizard to be a much more variable environment becomes much more um, homogenous across elevation. But we can take this one step further still. So one of the architects of the idea, um, Charles Bogert, whom I pictured here, came back a few years later and published a really interesting paper in 1949 in Evolution in which he said, wait a minute, organisms by behaviorally thermal regulating aren't just you know, modifying the temperatures that they experience. In so doing, they're effectively modifying natural selection. They are buffering themselves from selection. And the traits that behavior can shield from selection should evolve more slowly than the traits that cannot be shielded from selection. Um, in honor of Charles Bogert, we call this idea the Bogert effect, but it's also known as behavioral inertia. And that's precisely what's going on with these lizards. CT min is under selection when temperatures are coolest, also the most thermally homogenous time of day, very little variation for behavior to play with. Also, anoles are inactive at night. So CT min evolves an order of magnitude faster than CT max. So it, uh, we do observe that 
body temperature, and CT max, these traits that behavioral thermal regulation can shield from selection um, during the thermally heterogeneous, highly variable daytime, um, evolve much more slowly than CT min. Now, a question you might wonder is, why do these high elevation anoles go through all of that trouble? Why would they behaviorally adjust for their environments to maintain their ancestral physiology? Why just not adjust your physiology to the cold environments? Well, one possibility is that these upper thermal limits are for some reason evolutionarily rigid. Maybe they simply can't evolve. So I, was, I gathered as many data as I could find for um, CT max in squamates. And I observed more than 25 degrees Celsius variation based on 268 observations. So obviously CT max can evolve. When we zoom in on anoles, we capture you know, more than 20 degrees Celsius variation in CT max. So it's not the case that CT max is inert in the broad you know, macroevolutionary sense across all squamates or even across all anoles. Instead, what I think these montane anoles are doing is physiologically capitalizing on the benefits of performing at a higher core temperature. Um, due to you know, certain biochemical principles, in general, if organisms perform a task at a higher temperature up until a certain point, they can do that at a higher maximal performance. So, okay, where are we now? Behavioral thermal regulation can shield organisms from selection, essentially, you know, stop evolution dead in its tracks. I started thinking about this more and I started wondering, is this an artifact of, you know, is this have something to do with these cybatoid anoles? Is this, you know, a Hispaniolan phenomenon in anoles? Is this an island phenomenon? Or is this something that characterizes anoles in general? So the next step in this process was really to zoom out to the entire lineage to decipher whether this signature of thermal regulation and the Bogert effect um, characterize, at, at what level does it fall apart? And here comes in a graduate student at WashU, actually. This is Giancarlo Salazar, who was an undergraduate student in my laboratory at the time. And that's exactly what we set out to find. So John undertook the Herculean task of gathering every datum that had ever been published on body temperature or critical thermal maximum in anoles, including some of his own data that he collected in Colombia. And in total, we had more than 100 species in this data set. And our first question was simply, does, does thermal regulation differ between island and mainland anoles? Do they, do they interact with their thermal environments differently? So what I'm gonna show you here is mean annual temperature on the x-axis. This is a, you know, a crude proxy for the thermal environment that organisms occupy and mean body temperature on the y-axis. Each point is a different species of anole. Those in orange are island species and those in blue are mainland species. And what we found was that there is a pretty substantial difference in fact between the way that mainland and island lizards interact with the thermal environment. Now body temperature is a bit of a noisy variable, right? It's subject to um, weather conditions and a, a ton of other features. Nonetheless, what really struck me was that temperatures in island lizards tend to remain high and relatively stable despite thermal environment, whereas on the mainland, there was a surprisingly tight relationship between mean annual temperature and mean body temperature, suggesting that mainland lizards were effectively tracking their local thermal conditions, whereas island lizards appear to thermoregulate a bit more. So this was exciting. This suggests that what we found may not be restricted necessarily to the cybatoids or Hispaniola. This might actually be something that characterizes island anoles in general. So if thermal regulation is greater on islands, is it also the case that the Bogart effect is occurring? Is heat tolerance slower on islands than on the mainland? And are they evolving to a higher optimal thermal to uh, heat tolerance due to the hotter is better effect? To do this, we fitted a series of evolutionary models to uh, the heat tolerance data. I'll summarize them briefly, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask afterwards. The simplest model is a simple single rate Brownian motion model in which differences among species uh, in CT max are simply proportionate to branch length. A slightly more complex Brownian motion model allows the rate of evolution to vary between island and mainland lizards. The other models are all adaptive models of evolution or ornstein ullenbeck These assume that there's an evolutionary optimum um, that is uh, attracting to which species are attracted. Um, and the simplest of these models uh, assumed a single rate of evolution and a single shared global optimum for both mainland and island anoles. And the more complex model allowed both the rate 
and the optimal trait parameter or theta to vary between island and mainland species. So to summarize, there were five models that varied in complexity and the overwhelming support was for a two rate, two optimum model, indicating that mainland and island anoles are on independent evolutionary trajectories for CT max, both in terms of their rate and the, uh, the theta, the evolutionary optimal trait parameter to which they're uh, being drawn. But is that in the direction one would predict based on the Bogert effect? So if thermal regulation is slowing heat tolerance evolution in island lizards, we would expect a slower rate and we would also expect a higher optimal trait value for theta. Each of the points you're about to observe come from a, a different stochastic character map. So there's a lot of points because there were 500 stochastic character maps, but that's essentially, that's exactly what we observed. We do observe the Bogert effect, a strong signal of the Bogert effect in island lizards. Uh, heat tolerance evolution is about three to four times slower in island lizards and they're evolving to a much higher, four degrees Celsius higher optimal trait value for theta. So um, this is interesting. If you study anoles in general, this might even strike you as somewhat weird because if anything, anoles are paragons, especially island anoles are paragons of rapid evolution. And if you looked at morphology, traits typically associated with ecomorphology, such as body size, tail length and head length, that's precisely what you would observe. Island lizards do evolve more quickly than uh, mainland lizards. And the mechanism for this is thought to be ecological opportunity. These lizards um, on the Caribbean islands have been re released from their ancestral predators and competitors, resulting in rapid evolution. Yet, when we look at morphology, we find the opposite. We find an island Bogert effect of slower evolution. So what gives? Well, we explored a few options. Um, perhaps habitats on islands are just simply warmer. Maybe climatic niches evolve faster on the mainland. Um, maybe at a finer scale, thermal habitat structure differs. To the extent that we could examine these ideas, we didn't find any support for them, but we did stumble upon something quite interesting that differentiates mainland and island anoles. So my first expedition, um, to work with the knolls was actually in Costa Rica on the mainland. And when I started working with the knolls, uh, you could go in and they, you, they would act a lot like what this lizard is doing, being very, very cryptic and not doing much at all. So in fact, I used to think when I first started that anoles just didn't move around a lot, were incredibly cryptic. And then I started working on Hispaniola and in the Caribbean in general. Um, and I found out that no, quite the opposite. Island anoles move around a lot and spend, they spend most of their day moving around, displaying, and in my opinion, making themselves as conspicuous as possible. And the reason for this is ecological opportunity. Um, released from these predators and competitors, these island lizards can spend a lot more time engaging in other activities and moving around their habitats. But moving around one's habitat doesn't just impact, you know, or trigger um, adaptive radiation and ecomorphology, it impacts the costs and benefit analysis that organisms experience when determining whether or not to thermoregulate. So thermoregulation reflects a trade-off between the benefits, you know, for example, of a higher performance um, against the costs, which include exposure to predators and competitors, which is precisely the thing they've been released from in these island environments. So the surprising result is that ecological opportunity, this, this feature that is so almost universally associated with faster evolution can actually reduce the cost of thermal regulation and therefore indirectly slow um, trade evolution. So, so far, I think I really, you know, beat the drum uh, on, on behavior being this arresting force in evolution. But if anything, um, and that's certainly one view, if anything, though, the classical view is quite the opposite. It's actually that behavior drives evolution. One of the chief proponents of this idea was Ernst Meyer, who spent a very big portion of his career, um, you know, exploring the tropical regions of the world and the birds that occupied those regions. And he hypothesized that the incredible diversity of birds is due in no small part to behavior. Behavior allows organisms to um, exploit new resources within their environments or enter new environments altogether and in so doing, they expose themselves to natural selection and accelerate evolution. And I'm not saying that behavioral inertia or the Bogart effect and behavioral drive are mutually exclusive ideas. They certainly aren't. 
But I can say that they've been largely studied independently. We gather some data and then determine whether the trade in question um, is being shielded from selection or exposed to selection and make some inference about whether behavioral drive or inertia might be occurring. Um, I'd like to explore a different idea, which is that the same behavior can simultaneously shield organisms from selection, but in so doing, they must change some way that they interact with resources. And if that's true, then they might also simultaneously be exposing themselves to selection. So it might be the case that behavioral inertia and drive are fundamentally linked. So to explore this idea, I really wanted to mechanistically understand what is it that these island lizards are doing to thermoregulate? What, how are Anolis armori and Anolis shrevi, these montane lizards, behaviorally thermoregulating? So in order to do that, I visited two low and high elevation sites in Hispaniola to finally map out um, thermoregulatory patterns for these lizards. The two low elevation sites, one from each mountain chain and the foothills of each mountain chain, are what you'd expect, you know, very warm, music, broadleaf forest, um, mean annual temperatures of about 26 degrees Celsius. At high elevation, again, we are in these, uh, you know, monodominant pine forests uh, flanked by savanna with rocky outcrops, really, really different habitat. At each of the, so in order to determine whether and how organisms are thermoregulating, we need three pieces of data. We need to know what does the thermal environment look like to a lizard? You know, what temperatures are available to it? The second thing we need to know is what are the temperatures of the lizards? How do the temperatures relate to the, uh, the availability of temperatures in their environment? And we also need to know what's the thermal range they're theoretically targeting. So in order to do that, we need to get some perspective of the preferred thermal temperatures of lizards in the absence of ecological constraints. So the, to get the, to understand the distribution of, of available temperatures in each environment, what I did was deploy these thermal sensors inside of these copper electroformed lizards. These are, this is sort of silly, inside of each of these electroformed copper lizards is an I button. And the reason we use electroformed copper is that it has a simil similar thermal inertia to live lizards. It heats up and cools off at similar rates. And I deployed them on boulders and tree trunks. These are trunk round anoles. So the perches, they most often, they're most often found within a meter and a half of the ground. And so therefore their most commonly utilized perches are tree trunks and boulders. So we deployed them in equal numbers on, on boulders and tree trunks, and we let them just record temperature every 10 minutes over the course of six days in each of these habitats. During that same time period, we were out in the habitats looking for lizards and recording temperatures from as many that, as we could get our hands on. And of course, this is the really fun part of the adventure. And um, then we, we, we took some lizards from the wild and we brought them back into the lab and we measured their preferred temperature using a laboratory heat gradient that ranged from 18 degrees Celsius on one end to 40 degrees Celsius on the other. And over the course of several hours, just simply allowed lizards to choose where to sit in that gradient. And that gave us a perspective of what thermal range they're theoretically targeting. So before I walk you through the data, I'm gonna actually show you what they look like um, here. So these are gonna be histograms. And what I'm gonna show you here are the distribution of environmental temperatures and if the distribution of body temperatures of lizards basically overlap quite cleanly in range and mean, we would infer that that population is comprised of thermoconforming lizards. If in contrast, the range and the mean of temperatures is very different from the temperatures available to the lizards in the environment, we would infer instead that lizards are thermoregulators. So here are the data. I'm gonna show you the data for uh, low elevation first. The Eastern mountains are on the, uh, right and the Western mountains on the left. I'm gonna show you temperatures on boulders, tree chunks from the lizards and then the preferred range. So here are the temperatures we measured on boulders. Here are the temperatures we measured on tree trunks. Here are the temperatures we measured from lizards. So Mike, thermal conformers or thermal regulators? Regulators? Well, in this case, they're thermal conformers, that's okay. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky because um, they don't actually need to thermoregulate to achieve temperatures within their preferred range. So it's a little bit tricky. So their temperatures pretty much overlap with the available temperatures in the environment. So it seems like they don't thermoregulate and they don't. They don't do so precisely. But the reason for this is that their environments are sort of optimally warm. They can achieve temperatures within their preferred range 
a lot of the time without really being you know too selective with where they perch so they don't thermoregulate because they really don't need to in contrast here are the temperatures that i measured at high elevation on boulders on tree trunks trees are colder than boulders i promise this is a highly scientific finding and here are the temperatures i measured from lizards so mike thermoconformers or thermoregulators regulators that's right, 100% incredibly precise thermal regulators. So here's the temperature range that they're actually targeting. Look um, just how uh, rare those temperatures are in their habitats. They're targeting this very narrow sliver of temperatures and they do so incredibly precisely. When we zoom in on this range of thermally optimal temperatures, we can see two things. First, as I stated earlier, trees are really cold. In fact, 95% of the temperatures that I measured on trees were simply too cold for lizards, did not enter their thermally optimal range. Boulders, in contrast, were five to six times more likely to be within the preferred range of lizards. So to put this differently, an enterprising lizard could effectively thermoregulate at high elevation simply by eschewing tree trunks and choosing instead to perch on boulders. And that's precisely what these high elevations are, lizards are doing. At low elevation, these lizards exhibit the arboreal niche that is typical of anoles. And at high elevation, they've almost perfectly switched over to become saxicolous or boulder dwelling lizards. So why does this matter? Well, if you recall from Jonathan's work in the Caribbean, um, lizards are, morphologically speaking, where they perch, just like we are what they eat. Lizards are where they perched. So if an, if an anole modifies how it interacts with its structural microhabitat, it often induces a major evolutionary response in morphology. So the natural follow-up question to this is, well, are, do we detect morphological shifts consistent with its perch switch from tree trunks to boulders? So we collected some adults from the, uh, from the wild and we measured a few dimensions that tend to shift when lizards become boulder dwelling with respect to arboreal ancestors. And these distill down to skull and limb measurements. So what I'm gonna show you here are the results for, for this analysis. I'm gonna show you population means, these are residual plots. So in this case, we're gonna look at head height first. A higher value indicates a population of lizards with a relatively broader skull. And a smaller value indicates lizards with a more dorsoventrally compressed skull. And what we discovered was that in both the Eastern and the Western mountains, those high elevation lizards exhibit dorsal ventral compression in their skulls. They're much flatter. This makes intuitive sense. These lizards don't just perch on these boulders during the day you know, to warm up. They defend them as territories. Um, they sleep under them at night. They retreat under them from predators. And dorsal ventral compression you know, eases access into the narrow crevices that these high elevation lizards occupy. Um, our next question, though, was, is this an artifact of the lizards essentially growing up in these, you know, boulder cold environments? Is this an environmental effect or is it, in, is it heritable? So we conducted a common garden experiment in which we brought high and low elevation lizards from the Western mountains into the lab. We reared their offspring under common conditions, and then we remeasured their morphological traits when they reached adulthood. And in fact, those same differences persisted. Those high elevation lizards um, have dorsal evolved dorsoventrally compressed skulls uh, when compared to their low elevation counterparts. We also discovered that these high elevation lizards also have shorter femora and tibiae. And when we looked at the common garden, we also detected that those differences persisted in the laboratory rear generation. Um, there's a little more debate about the role of hind limb length in um, boulder dwelling lizards, but there is evidence that limb parity, by this I mean similarity in limb length between fore and hind limbs, assists with climbing and balance during climbing on vertical structures. So um, what, why did this occur? So this occurs be because, first of all, species niches are multidimensional and the resources that they use um, can impinge on multiple niche axes. So when this lizard, for example, um, chose to perch on this really hot leaf, it didn't just make a decision about the thermal environment that it was gonna experience, it made a whole slew of decisions. It made a, you know, a decision about the radiative environment that it experiences, the hydric environment. This substrate that it's perching on has a height, a certain frictive coefficient, a surface area, right? It's made a decision about the predators, competitors, and parasites that it's going to experience. So it's really hard. It, the, the broader point is that 
it's it, this is probably not an exception. It's probably the case that whenever an organism makes a behavioral decision, it has multiple potentially contrasting selective and therefore evolutionary consequences on the phenotype. And the same behavior that can arrest evolution in one dimension does so at the expense of exposing it to selection on another. Okay, so at this point, I think I've really emphasized the dual role of behavior as a motor in a break for evolution and just sort of really uh, underscore the importance of behavior in general for understanding how these organisms, you know, the evolution of these organisms. A separate but related question is why does it matter, you know? And I think that it does matter, especially in the context of global change. So we know that rising temperatures are a threat to biodiversity, but not all organisms are e equally at risk. A growing body of theory underscores the exceptional vulnerability of tropical organisms, especially ectotherms like anoles. As a key line of defense, tropical organisms are able to shift their geographic ranges to track the emergence of thermally suitable habitats at higher elevation. As warming continues, however, species restricted to um, tropical summits will eventually run out of suitable habitat. So confronted with these hard upper limits to upslope retreat, um, tropical montane species, especially ectotherms, might be riding an express escalator to extinction. And this is actually a pretty widespread phenomenon and an issue of really key concern in ecology, evolution, and conservation. Yet when we consider species like Anolis armori and Anolis shrevi, these montane anoles actually like it pretty warm. Um, in almost every respect that we've examined, they're physiologically indistinguishable from their lowland counterparts. So our first step was to build a series of biophysical models that explicitly incorporate lizards' physiology and behavior to predict the availability of thermally suitable habitat as the climate continues to warm. And when we do so, what we discover is that warming actually benefits these lizards, especially severe warming. So what I've done here is clip out the ranges for Anolis armori and Anolis shrevi. And what you'll observe is that rising temperatures dramatically expand the number of hours available for activity. Um, basically, these maps become purpler is another way to summarize this. Um, the, and the activity gain is, is actually quite substantial. So, um, Rising temperatures reduce cold stress by minimizing the frequency of temperatures that they'll dip below their CT min, yet their heat tolerance is so high and their environments are so cold that decreasing cold stress doesn't simultaneously increase heat stress. So it seems like maybe these anoles are poised to avoid the death knell of the escalator to extinction. But before we get too excited, um, there's a bit more to consider. So these lizards are distributed exclusively in high elevation pine forests and savanna. As the pine forest seeds at lower elevation, um, where it gets warmer and wetter to broadleaf forests like cloud forest, Anolis armori and shrevi are replaced by Anolis cybodes, that really widespread species. So our next step was just to ask whether climate warming will alter the availability of the macro habitat, the high elevation monodominant pine forest to which these montane species are inexorably linked. And indeed, that's exactly what we find. Here I'm showing the predicted elevation of various plant species in Hispaniolan cloud forests. So what you see is that warming is predicted to make higher elevations more climatically suitable to those plants, resulting in a predicted range shift to higher elevation. And if so, then the pine forest and savanna on which these montane species de depends is predicted to shrink. Making matters even worse, the upslope shift of broadleaf forest has the potential to also transport Anolis cybodes into habitats it doesn't currently occupy. So right now, cybodes is basically thermally excluded from the highest elevations of Hispaniola because of the stressfully cold temperatures up there. That changes under climate warming. Anolis cybodes gains hours of activity, a lot of activity actually. It gains more activity, uh, more relative activity than even the species currently in those ranges. So um, I wanna clarify though, that I don't think warming is necessarily going to bring these species into more frequent direct contact. However, the presence of cybodes might create space occupancy effects that limit the expansion of Anolis shrevi and armori into, into other habitat types, a phenomenon that is known as the boxcar effect. So in other words, the rising cloud forest and the potential upslope shift of Anolis cybodes could essentially pin Anolis armori and Anolis shrevi into progressively shrinking mountaintop ranges. <laughs> 
So what's the bigger message here? Well, the point is that resilience isn't enough. These montane anoles are intrinsically resilient to rising temperatures, yet they're extrinsically vulnerable to macrohabitat loss. Um, capturing such nuances in pattern versus process in the extinction es escalator pretty much necessitates an explicitly mechanistic approach. To hammer this point home, standard correlative models based just on museum records and not incorporating behavior and physiology basically predict warming-driven extirpation of these, of these montane anoles, not resilience. Um, in other words, we could have converged on the same answer, that is vulnerability to the extinction escalator, but for the wrong reason. Okay, so hopefully I've shown not only that behavior can slow evolution or speed it up, um, but that it really does matter for resilience um, to climate change and that it really impacts our understanding of where and how organisms might be vulnerable. Um, I wanna talk just briefly at the very end, now that we're wrapping up, on where we go from here and what's going on in the lab. So as Mike mentioned, my lab moved to Yale about a year ago and um, we are working on a whole bunch of new and exciting projects. I'm gonna share a few of them with you. Um, one of the main research foci in my lab centers around Appalachian salamanders, especially those in the genus Plethodon. They're also known as woodland salamanders in Plethodon. I've been fascinated with this group for a really long time. Um, they're hyper diverse in North America, especially in the Appalachian Mountains, whereas most, uh, most organisms, certainly herpetofauna in general, tend to achieve peak biodiversity in the tropics. Um, despite really high species richness, they, this lineage isn't particularly um, diverse with respect to morphology. In fact, they're pretty much a classic case of non-adaptive radiation. Yet, as lungless amphibians, they're plethodontid, so they don't have lungs, their ecology is tightly linked both to moisture and temperature. Already, we're discovering really fine-scale behavioral structuring with respect to microclimate among species, with some species in the lineage specialized to cooler, drier conditions, and others specialized to warmer, wetter conditions. This hints at an adaptive radiation driven, at least in part, by specialization into distinct microclimatic niches, which is exactly what we're exploring. Another thing that we're working on is the evolution of live birth, um, focusing on phrynosomatids. This is a lineage in which viviparity has independently arisen um, five times. In every single case, we've detected parallel decreases in physiology such that these viviparous lizards are much more physiologically cool adapted and they behaviorally prefer to seek out microclimates that are cool, even if their environment is warm, even if they're found at low elevation. Um, basic, uh, using the metabolic theory of ecology, we're demonstrating that these behavioral shifts can metabolically compensate for the higher energetic demands of pregnancy um, without having to precipitate differences in other aspects of the phenotype, namely body size, which might be under other aspects of selection. We are, of course, continuing with the adaptive radiation of anoles, but we're panning out to the entire radiation in general. And much of this work in my lab is being led by a graduate student, Brooke Bodensteiner. And effectively, the adaptive radiation, as we've described in this talk, is characterized not just by structural microhabitat differences among species resulting in equal morphological divergence, but also with respect to the thermal niche across elevation into different thermal macrohabitats and along the sun shade axis um, with respect to closed versus open canopy structure. Um, what we're discovering is that whereas the morphological aspect of the radiation is basically a classic case of determinism, highly deterministic, the physiological axis of the radiation is much less deterministic and seems to be sculpted by some pretty key aspects of contingency, such as island, by, uh, island topography, for example. Finally, um, a lot of what I study with respect to adaptive radiation, it involves a lot of reconstructing the past, right? We look at this anolis adaptive radiation and we ask, what are the mechanisms that drove it to occur? How and why 
so sorry, everyone. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Am I able to finish that last slide or should I? Yeah, you can. Okay. <laughs> Let me share my keynote. Welcome back. <laughs> As I was describing, and I promise this is the last slide, this is the hook that was pulling me off. <laughs> um, essentially, we are leveraging um, the incredible genotype phenotype map that's available for E. coli to explore, um, you know, pulses of diversification using um, E. coli microbial systems using the Evo, Evo Comets framework. Um, my collaborators from this project are Alvaro Sanchez and Maria Rebolleda Gomez, both of whom are in Yale EEB. And we hope to sort of explore, you know, why adaptive radiation occurs in pulses, what's the role of epistasis and mutation order or genetic distance and driving patterns of sequential bursts of radiation. Um, that's some of the stuff that's going on in the lab. But First and foremost, and finally, I want to just thank all of you for being here during the summer series to a digital summer series for bearing with um, my unexpected technical issues at the very end. And I would be thrilled to take any questions you have. Thank you so much. I'm sure everybody out there is, uh, is giving you some thunderous applause for a terrific talk. Um, and we will just chalk up your internet connectivity uh, to me being cursed. And uh, we'll just give it a second to see if there's some questions uh, that roll in here on the chat. Um, and uh, while we wait, um, I'll, I'll quickly pose one. Um, so to what extent do you think males and females are using different habitats? And is there some scope for sex specific evolution or perhaps constraints caused by sexually antagonistic selection? Yeah, that's a great question. So to the extent that I was able to explore that, I didn't find any major differences in, in how the males and females interact with the thermal environments. It's I didn't do an explicit test, you know, I didn't design a study to go out there and explore that, but I have included males and females in both my thermal and morphological analyses and the same patterns that are true in one sex are true in the other. However, to be sure that they were not using the environment differently, I'd rather go back and do a more explicit exploration. I think it would be a really great avenue for, for research, especially since um, males and females do differ in a lot of key uh, you know, features. They, they behave differently, they display at different rates. So there are things that are probably um, a little more, that it would take a little more fine tooth comb to go through, but I think would be worth exploring. Interesting. Um, so a question coming in um, from Dr. Kim Medley, who is the director of the biological station, um, was wondering about some of the behaviors that the anoles use uh, in thermoregulating and, and whether they might uh, sort of actually elevate their entire trunks uh, to, to try to keep cool in, in hot parts of the day. No. Po I mean, sure, postural differences are possible. Um, I didn't really observe any major postural differences. The really big difference is where they're active. So at low elevation, they are, except really early in the morning and late in the afternoon, they're almost exclusively found in shade. And it's, simple, it's as easy as moving from the hot, sunny side of the tree trunk to a different time of day and then move to the shady side. And they, for, as far as I can tell, they behave in the same way, they posture in the same way, they just alter which side of the tree trunk, for example, they're active on. This is also true, you know, even for the boulder dwelling lizards, they, but the, the effect is in reverse. So those lizards are rarely active when it's shady or overcast. And then suddenly if the sun comes out, all of a sudden you see this mass exodus of anoles from their underground, you know, their sub boulder retreats onto the boulders to sun themselves. So they, they do the same thing very, I'm very picky about when and where they'll be active by um, time of day and shade structure. Postural differences could contribute to that. Um, in my experience with the anoles, I didn't, I could maybe hypothesize without too much data to back this up that the anoles at high elevation tend to be a little more flush with the boulders that they perch on early in the day. And that might, through thigmothermy, um, allow them to warm up faster. 
it is potential that there is potential that that might be going on as well. Interesting. Thanks. Um, Dr. Katie Westby is interested to know uh, if the lizards have sort of a more sessile life stage or season where they're not perhaps as active and that they may uh, evolve differently, uh, sort of the more mobile or active stages of the life cycle. Okay. Um, I don't know. Could, could she clarify, they, could they clarify um, what type of evolution they might predict to differ between active versus inactive times of year? Um, it, there's a little bit of a lag, so we'll see if the question comes in, but I, I guess I was also sort of curious about whether, um, whether they might be using different habitats in different parts of their life cycles, perhaps differences uh, between juveniles and adults, or, or perhaps like seasonal differences and whether there might be some degree of modularity or, or, or sort of more general life cycle constraints. Right, so due to logistics, my field work has primarily centered in the summer when lizards are most active, we don't have classes and just logistical reasons. So I don't have as much experience observing these lizards um, in the off season during different times of year. But I suspect that the differences, uh, you know what, I actually don't know. I suspect that there might be differences, especially at high elevation that I haven't been able to capture and I haven't observed. Interesting. Um, well, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap up since it's 5.05 again. And um, I hope that everyone at home um, uh, will join me in giving a big round of applause for Dr. Munoz. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again um, when normal activities uh, resume. Uh, thank you and, uh, and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank you everyone. Yeah.